A year of life as an Eskimo among Eskimos had a profound influence upon the development of my views because it led me away from my former interests and towards the desire to understand what determines the behavior of human beings. In 1883, a young German scientist called Franz Boas arrived here in the Canadian Arctic. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. He came here to do two things. He'd originally done part of his training in geography, and he was going to map as much of the coastline, which was pretty much uncharted in those days, as possible. He was also going to indulge his new interest, the study of culture. The year before he came up here, he'd been reading up as much as possible about the Arctic. But unlike most explorers, he'd also bothered to take some courses in the local language in Uktitut. He arrived at Kirkerton Island, just over that hill, which was run by a whaler called James Much. It was a thriving station at the time, and in fact the largest Inuit settlement in the area. James Much made caribou clothing for Boaz and his servant, William Vike, and outfitted them with a team of dogs. In the course of the 12 months he was up here, Boaz traveled something like 3,000 miles on foot, by boat, and on sleds like this. The work he was to do up here was eventually to change the direction of his own life, but it was also to change the way we think about other cultures and the way we think about ourselves. Okay, hey, 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 let's go. Hey, 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 hey. Boaz didn't set out with a specific ambition to study human culture, but he had dreamt of going to the polar regions since his boyhood in Germany. He was born in 1858 in Minden, Westphalia. His father was a prosperous businessman in the town, and at the age of 20, Boaz left home to study geography at the University of Heidelberg. It was during his year of compulsory military training in 1881 that he decided to study the relation of the Eskimo to their environment. In his own words, he was going to collect anthropological material and make a thorough study of the language, customs and habits of the Eskimo. Anthropology was beginning to take form and develop about the time that he entered the picture. It was an exciting new field and it offered an opportunity to get some idea of the dynamics of culture and their growth and development and their adaptation and the way they spread and many, many aspects of this, which would be fundamental to understanding our own culture and our own way of life. And this kind of research was innovative and uh, pioneering, so it offered a very exciting prospect to him. Before Boaz's day, the Eskimo who lived all round the North Polar Cap had not been closely studied. He undertook a geographical expedition to map uncharted areas of the coastline of Baffin Island and to get to know the different groups of Eskimo who lived there. The only way to the Arctic in those days was by boat when the ice had melted and Boaz readily accepted passage to Cumberland Sound on a ship called the Germania. In his months on Baffin Island, Boaz was to complete the first accurate survey of Cumberland Sound and Davis Strait, a considerable piece of Arctic exploration in itself. But today, the trip is better remembered for his observations of Eskimo life. He wrote articles for a German newspaper who had partly sponsored his trip. 
but he also kept a diary of letters to present to his fiancée on his return. These provide a fascinating insight into the ambitions, frustrations, hardships and loneliness of Arctic exploration before the turn of the century. Only two days more, and the year begins which will take me to you. The time passes almost too quickly for the amount of work I have to do here. If I accomplish everything, I still will not have the time to finish the map and the ethnographic work. I shall, however, attain my own purposes very well. I know very accurately about the migration of the Eskimo and the routes they take, how they travel back and forth, and their relationship to neighboring tribes. One of the things that intrigued him as a geographer was their detailed knowledge of the landscape, a fact he discovered when he started to chart the coastline. As their knowledge of all the directions is very detailed and they are skillful draftsmen, they can draw very good charts. If a man intends to visit a country little known to him, he has a map drawn in the snow by someone well acquainted there. And these maps are so good that every point can be recognized. Actually, if I, if this is uh, Frobisher Bay here, mm -hmm. and this is Allen Island here, yeah. which is the north on this map? The Eskimo exhibit a thorough knowledge of the geography of their country. The area they travel over is of considerable extent. They have a very clear conception of all the countries they have seen or heard of, knowing the distances by days' journeys, or as they say, by sleeps, and the directions by the cardinal points. Boaz got the Eskimo of Cumberland Sound to draw these maps on paper. These he collected and brought back. They compared remarkably well with his own. As a geographer, he'd been taught to believe that the life of people like the Eskimo was entirely determined by their environment. He was finding out the hard way that this couldn't be the case. Today I went hunting, but not with exactly splendid success. The only thing I shot was pulled under the ice by the current. There I sat, like an Eskimo, behind my ice hole at the water's edge, and patiently waiting for a head to appear. I cannot imagine what an impression it makes in this cold season to sit so near the edge of the water and to hear the roaring and foaming. Thick fog from the cold water envelops me. At my feet, the water foams and hisses. Only a strong current keeps the water from freezing here. Last night, I dreamt very vividly that I was in America and with you. The dream was so vivid that I was most disappointed when I woke up in the morning to find myself in the igloo. You must not imagine that such a snow hut is a cold home. It is completely papered with skins and two lamps are kept burning. We supply light and heat. We all sit on a large platform which is covered with caribou skins. But I think I still prefer a European home. Today I hunted just as an Eskimo, with a spear and all that goes with it. Okse Tung was the only one who caught anything, two seals, which I immediately acquired. As you see, Marie, I am now a true Eskimo. I live as they do, hunt with them, and belong to the men of Ananintung. Some Baffin Island communities live a life that is in many ways the same as the one that Boaz witnessed in Cumberland Sound almost a hundred years ago. And the qualities that so impressed him then are still needed for survival. Today the populations that Boaz called Eskimo are known as the Inuit. 
For those like Akashu, who choose to live a largely traditional life, hunting for food during winter is still precarious, even with a rifle. Like his ancestors, Akashu and his family live largely off caribou or seal. Even with all the help of a new technology, game can be hard to kill. This was the eighth seal he'd stalked that day. The others had all got away. Boaz witnessed life among the Eskimo firsthand. It was hardly a case of the gentleman explorer. He saw how much they depended on their environment and how unyielding it could be. But he also depended on them. And as he charted the coast and filled in the physical features of their landscape, he was impressed by the way in which they had mastered life on top of the world. Whether it was traveling over ice and snow, tracking and hunting game, or fabricating their clothes and houses, or caring for their teams of dogs, Boaz had to admit, as he reflected on human life in the frozen north, that what he had learned as a geographer was incomplete. He came to realize that the Eskimo often did things in spite of the restrictions of their surroundings and not because of them. Environment wasn't the only thing that determined culture. Oxe Tong has caught two seals today, and every man in the settlement is to receive a piece. Is it not a beautiful custom among these savages that they bear all deprivations in common and also are at their happiest best eating and drinking when someone has brought back booty from the hunt? The Eskimo are sitting around me, their mouths filled with raw seal liver. The spot of blood on the back of the paper shows you how I joined in. I often ask myself what advantages our good society possesses over that of the savages, and find the more I see of their customs that we have no right to look down upon them. We have no right to blame them for their forms and superstitions, which may seem ridiculous to us. We highly educated people are much worse, relatively speaking. A person's worth should be judged by the warmth of his heart. Today, most of the Inuit on Baffin Island live in towns like Frobisher Bay. But this Inuit community, formed around one family, have made the decision to live away from those largely white settlements.
آتمان خلوی خلوی پیا تمکو فکر کرده ازی چیزی نامم خواهی متی خواهی جو گلوار خلو ناتی تو خلو ناتی تو کو خواه نگونی خلوی دکون نگونی تامی رو تو هست بی جو گلوار تمان نلی آه اوی مکتار تی نه اوی مک ایرا خلو ناتی تو چیزی نامم آخرش متی تو رو گلوار خلوی دکون تی هاتا کردی چیزی نامم هست بی جو گلوار خلوی هاتا رو میتاد پری تی نه خلوی دکون نمیگاتی Atamanna, apa yang ni anak tak kunwa, kalau cuma tak kunwa, kalau tuan tu tak mana sedikit otak. Ida ni kut, okey kut, sila dah main nak tengok kita kalau jual otak tu. Akak akak nak tu mungkin tu bingar otak ida ni kut. Ida tu habis tak kacau nak tu jual ni tak mana, nasi mana nak kubai nangit tu kalau atamanna, anak pelaku tu jual nangit nak kuda mungkin tu tamanya punya cuaca yang kuat sebab. Isteri bapa orang nak sebab yang orang tu pun boleh amal itu juga mesti isteri bapa orang nak sebab juga aku nak mod siapa nak mod lu. Itu mana anak pelaku tu kita yang kita kah, anak itu hatangan sebab tu nak kubai orang kubai orang kita nak lawat tu kasih bapa. I believe if this trip has for me as a thinking person a valuable experience, it lies in the strengthening of the viewpoint of the relativity of all cultivation, and that the evil as well as the value of a person, lies in the cultivation of the heart, which I find or do not find here just as much as amongst us. And that all service, therefore, which a man can perform for humanity must serve to promote truth. Indeed, if he who promotes truth searches for it and spreads it, it may be said that he has not lived in vain. In 1885, Boaz returned to Germany. I was working in the Royal Ethnographic Museum of Berlin, cataloguing the collection of Bella Kula masks. My fancy was struck by the flight of imagination in the works of art. I could see the wealth of thought hidden behind the grotesque masks of these tribes. The attraction became irresistible. Because academic jobs were hard to come by for people like Boaz, America seemed like a better prospect. His liberal views and Jewish origins counted against him in Germany. They would matter less in a country with so many established immigrant communities. And then there were affairs of the heart. His fiancée, Mary Krakowica, lived with her family in New York. In America, Boaz had found himself a freer intellectual climate, a new home and a devoted wife. In 1887, he married. He also found himself an anthropological project that was to occupy him for the rest of his life. In 1893, Chicago hosted a World Columbian Exposition. As chief assistant to the anthropology section, Boaz arranged for native peoples to show off their cultures. A group of Eskimos, for example, built an igloo and worked their dogs. But now his major interest was the cultures that lived on the northwest coast of America. His ambition to display the richness of native Indian life led on to a job as curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He came here in the late 1890s. And during that time, he did a tremendous amount of work in building up the research program. It began with uh, an idea of Boaz's to go out and work in the northwest coast and work with the Indian groups there because they were being endangered of disappearing and their culture uh, disintegrating. We wanted to make as complete a collection of the, their culture as possible and preserve as much of their material culture as he could. Stretching from Alaska down to northern California through present-day British Columbia, the tribes of the northwest coast of America were one of the richest and most distinctive areas of cultural wealth that Europeans had encountered. The Pacific coast here forms an inextricable net of channels and fjords. Numerous islands form a narrow passage of water from the southern tip of British Columbia to Alaska, through which the ships glide as if on a river. This is a primeval country in all its loneliness. 
For a European, it is interesting to see nature so free. You can understand why anyone might think that environment entirely determines the way a culture develops when you come up here to the Pacific Northwest coast of America. These islands are as dramatic and as mysterious as the cultures they produced. Of course, Boaz knew that environment wasn't the only thing that shaped the way a culture developed. In 1886, he came up here to trace some of the other factors by considering the culture among the tribes of these islands. And what a fantastic group of tribes they were. Tribes like the Tlingit, Tsimshan, Haida, Bellacoola, and the tribe that Boaz came to know best, the Kwakiutl. For Boaz, this was an exciting area, mainly because of the way in which the tribes were related to each other. On the other hand, there were certain strong similarities in their culture. They shared common customs, beliefs, and ideas. Boaz hoped that the pattern of the differences and the similarities between the tribes, as he moved from area to area, would reveal more about the way in which a culture was shaped. At the end of the last century, the activities of traders, administrators, and of course the missionaries, were changing native life forever, and Boaz felt that his subject matter, in all its aspects, was disappearing. So he set about trying to save as much of it as possible. The way he went about this was to collect everything he found that had anything to do with the Indian way of life. In 1886, at Fort Rupert, then the centre of Kwakiutl life, Boaz got to know a prominent family called Hunt. It was with George Hunt that he struck up one of the most remarkable partnerships in anthropology. Agnes Alfred is one of the very few people left who remember the old days, as Chief Bobby Joseph explains. Oh, she, she was born here at the village island. Uh, born in the winter, she doesn't remember the month, but it was 96 years ago. 96. Did Franz Boas ever come here? Did she remember Franz Boas? Yeah, she, she, was... she says that obviously uh, Boas did come here. Oh. 
that's very important. She says that George uh, Hunt worked very closely with uh, with Borwith, uh, not only as an interpreter but as a, a total resource person. Uh, Granny says that had it not been for George Hunt and Borwith's efforts, that a lot of the traditions and customs now recorded may not have been recorded. Together they were scrupulously to document the world of a culture that nearly vanished. They collected everything they could of Indian life. Boaz taught Hunt how to write Kwakiutl, and this meant that whilst he was away from the field, Hunt could continue as the field researcher. They published papers jointly, and Boaz later emphasised that Hunt had made an indispensable contribution to his research. In 1901, Boaz's experience in organising the material objects of cultural life, both in Berlin and Chicago, landed him a job as curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Here he was radically to change the emphasis and aims of organising museum display. For him, these items should not just be a collection of curios, but rather impart systematic information and provide healthy entertainment and instruction. He held this post simultaneously with that of Professor of Anthropology at Columbia University in New York. But he didn't only teach. He was also responsible for organizing a massive research project known as the Jessup North Pacific Expedition. This, among other things, was aimed at documenting facts about the physical characteristics, culture and languages of all the tribes of the area, as well as collecting the elaborate objects that they made. If you want to know more about an object, it helps not only if you know how it was made, but what it was made for. Because of his intimate and detailed knowledge of Indian life, Boaz was able to place each of these objects in its original context. He understood where it fitted into Indian life, so it wasn't just another item in a museum catalogue. This splendid carving, for example, of an eagle is a representation of a mythical ancestor of a family that Boaz knew well living at Fort Rupert. It's a revealing mask and it shows that from the mythical ancestor the original and first member of the family appeared on earth. It's a funeral mask and three or four days after the death of a relative it was used in the ceremony to symbolize the fact that once someone had died they eventually returned to a land where all members of that family were once again eagles. The ancient and elaborate cultural life of peoples like the Kwakiutl was recorded in minute detail by Franz Boaz. Fortunately, we also have a visual record of what some aspects of life actually looked like, as one of Boaz's contemporaries was the great photographer of American Indians, Edward Curtis. Curtis had been travelling around America, making a photographic record of every remaining Indian tribe. As there were enough people alive who remembered the old ways, Curtis commissioned Indians to recreate life as it used to be. These were usually dramatic events, like the landing of war canoes, or performing of ceremonies in an authentic fashion, and he paid them to make all the necessary traditional objects. Although it was recreating the past and frowned upon by Boaz, it did place on record just how elaborate ceremonial life had been. One unusual feature of certain of these ceremonies was the disposal of vast quantities of personal wealth to the guests who attended. The distribution focused on two particular objects and raised interesting questions about value and exchange within the culture. 
Knowing what objects are doesn't always tell you everything about them. This piece of copper in the shape of a shield, for example, was almost certainly never used in combat. And this amazingly intricate and beautiful blanket of mountain goat's hair was not designed to keep people warm. They're ceremonial objects and particularly fine examples of their kind. They have great value for collectors of native art today. But when they circulated originally among the tribes along the northwest coast, they had a value that couldn't simply be measured in terms of money. This copper in the shape of a shield is a very interesting example of one of the things that puzzles anthropologists. On one level, they are a form of currency. In fact, the highest denomination in a native system of high finance. On the other, they are ceremonial objects, objects of great prestige. To own them is an honor. A lot's known about each individual copper. We know who made this one, for example. We know that it was called the killer whale copper. They could be bought or sold. They could be exchanged. They could even be given away. And very often, they were actually cut up, and pieces of the copper were distributed. Very often, they were even thrown into the sea as a flamboyant gesture. All of this behavior went on using the copper as a token of exchange in a ceremony, both lavish and complex, that has earned these tribes a lot of attention from anthropologists, and rightly so, because it was at the focus of their lives. That ceremony was called the potlatch. The economic system of the Kwagyutl Indians finds its expression in the so-called potlatch. The Indian has no system of writing, and therefore to give security to transactions they are performed publicly. This public contracting and paying of debts is the potlatch. It is largely based on credit, just as is the economic system of civilized communities. The standard of value is the blanket, but for larger transactions, Objects of imaginary value are used instead, particularly pieces of copper. These may strictly be compared to our banknotes. Boaz learned to use film to supplement his anthropological record. The subjects he chose were not spectacular, but they were an important record of aspects of Indian life. A woman swinging her baby in a cot. George Hunt carving wood and other crafts like spinning or weaving. He wanted to record the attitudes, postures and movements that went with various tasks and skills. She's not uh, uh, that optimistic that it may survive, although she's uh, encouraged by the numbers of uh, people who still hold our traditions and our beliefs strongly. And those are um, uh, demonstrated through contemporary potlatches now, be held, now being held every year by young people. So she's encouraged by that, but she's not certain if uh, that way of life will sustain itself. Village Island, one of the former centers of Kwakiutl culture, is now completely deserted. Bobby Joseph recalls life as it was. Part of the reason for the exodus from these places, like Village Island, for social pressure to change, to, to adopt the white man's way. And we were taught to, and told that the way to do that was to become educated and to be productive and be employed all the time. So people went with their children to uh, places where there were uh, learning centers where they thought there would be a better chance for their children to survive. You know? What sort of houses were these? So these were communal houses, um, two-room houses where a family of five or six might live. You know, These would probably be the first houses here. And uh, you would notice that a lot of them were built along the uh, foreshore. Because they were seafaring people, they, they just loved being uh, close to the water. You know? This village is quite famous for the uh, potlatch that it held once upon a time. Yeah, one of the most famous potlatches uh, ever held was held in 1921 by Chief Dan Cranmer, where the authorities, uh, including RCMP and the uh, 
government of Canada and missionaries chose to uh, prosecute uh, those participating in that potlatch. Because and it was once already and banned. For all, yeah, and once and for all trying to stamp it out. Like, yeah, it had already been banned by then. So what happened to uh, the people who had taken part? Oh, uh, quite a few of them were uh, uh, prosecuted and jailed. There were over uh, 22 people who were, went to jail. And others gave up their... The Quagyuto are not satisfied with the symbolism of their heraldry, but like to add a dramatic touch to their representations. This appears most clearly in the images which their chief set up on high poles fronting the houses, and in others which are placed in the center of the house in feasts. They are intelligible to the audience, but their meaning is further elucidated by songs, speeches, and actions. This totem pole stands in the middle of Kwakutl territory here on Village Island. It's the ultimate proclamation of Indian identity. But it's not the size so much that impresses us, it's the fabulous wooden carvings. And they're literally fabulous. Each one of these animals comes from a fable to which the family for whom this pole was made could lay claim. They are crests, if you like. In this case, the family could lay claim to killer whale, raven, wolf, and grizzly bear. This pole represents the status and the identity of the family that commissioned it. The fables and the animal emblems would be full of meaning for the man, his family, his friends, his allies, and for his rivals. Some of these villages are now deserted, and the meaning of most of these symbols has faded from memory, so it's tempting to think that the culture is dead. But because of anthropologists like Boaz, and of course the people themselves, the culture is very much alive and well. In fact, it's undergone a revival. Among the most prominent families involved in keeping the traditions alive are still the Hunts. The artist Richard Hunt is descended from George Hunt, the man Boaz trained to observe and record his own culture. I started about 20 years ago uh, carving with my father, um, just watching him in the basement and, and learning, playing with his tools, and then finally uh, trying to find a style for myself. It took about 10 years before I realized what, you know, what it was supposed to look like, and then after that, then it started becoming finer and finer, and I started working on a style of my own. I see myself as uh, a traditional artist because I still make pieces that are used in potlatches that people order to be used. Um, that's the meaning that comes out when people ask you to carve something for them. Now, if I wasn't carving the right thing, I wouldn't be getting asked very many times to do uh, carvings for people, so. Do you think anthropologists like Boaz have helped keep the tradition alive at all? Yeah, he kept a good record of uh, the dances, the uses of the masks, because some of the masks, uh, we wouldn't know how they would have been used unless um, you, we looked at what he wrote. And, you know, because all the older people are, are going now, so there's not really enough of them old people to tell the young people how the things should be done. So by reading Boaz, um, you know, you find out a lot. Boaz either overestimated the likelihood of all cultural knowledge disappearing, or he underestimated the Kwakiutl. People can today go back to his films, written works, and even the photographs he posed for to find out aspects of their own heritage that have been forgotten, but a great deal of tradition has been handed on from generation to generation in the old way. for memorial potlatches and for ordinary potlatches if you're, you know, showing your chieftainship um, how much wealth you got and stuff like that. 
I inherited mine from my grandfather. My dad passed it on to me. <clears throat> and now I'll pass it on to my sons, one of my oldest sons. It's our culture and it's, uh, we hate to lose it. During his visits to Fort Rupert, up on the northern tip of Vancouver Island, Boaz became aware of the importance of language. In the beginning, it was always hard work to ask about the language. Such a confusion of dialects and languages exist here that the material overwhelms me. The Kwagyutl language is much harder than I thought. I work on the grammar in the mornings, and in the afternoon, old fellas tell me stories. And in the evening, when George Hunt is free, I revise texts with him. But Boaz realized that language was more than simply a means for making yourself understood. He was becoming aware of the role of language as a vehicle for transmitting cultural identity itself. The old people remember Boaz speaking Kwakwala well, but with a heavy accent. He understood that as well as customs and objects, language was also part of the essence of the life of a culture. Okay, we wish. Sit ya. Sit ya. Is hair. Shoes. Shoes. Hair. Go come. 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 Today, although it isn't the first language of most Kwakiutl children, it is at least being taught. And Boas himself was teaching that language, like each aspect of the culture being studied, was an essential part in the understanding of social worlds that were so dramatically different from his own. His students were encouraged to see their own society in the context of a much wider range of possible social worlds. In the United States of the early 1900s, this wasn't just a subject of academic interest, for people of very different ethnic backgrounds were arriving in vast numbers. But these immigrants didn't only provide justification for cultural anthropology to be taught at university. For Boaz, they were ideal material for another of his interests, the biological aspect of human beings, what their physical characteristics were like, their shape, size, color, growth, and so on. He was interested in the way these features changed as different populations intermarried. Among other things, he wanted to see in what way environment influenced this process, and in New York, there was a laboratory for investigation on his doorstep. This is the Great Hall on Ellis Island. Something like 16 million immigrants at the beginning of this century. It was the legal gateway to a new life in America. They came in their hundreds every day to this island and sat and waited to be processed in this hall. They had to answer in English where they came from, how old they were, whether they had any serious diseases, how much money they had, whether they had new jobs to go to, whether they were prostitutes, whether they were anarchists. In 1908, they were asked another question, depending on whether they came from Europe or not. That was whether they minded if someone took some measurements of their bodies and heads. Franz Boas was working for the United States Immigration Commission, set up to report as to whether peoples from certain countries in Europe should be allowed into America. Were they or were they not racially inferior? It may have been a strange beginning to life in America, but Boaz's findings were an important development in the heated argument going on as to whether your racial characteristics placed limitations on your human potential. Eugenics was very much in the air. There's a good deal of uh, discussion about uh, which races were superior and which were inferior. And uh, the concern about not letting the national populations, not only in this country, but in England and 
in, in Europe deteriorate with inferior races, but to keep the standard up and to improve it. And they had ideas about certain races being superior to other races, so that kind of eugenics approach with a racist overtone uh, was very widespread in the 1910s, 1920s. There was a eugenic society in this country that was very active and had a number of rather well-known people who were associated with it. There's an underground feeling that almost anyone who wasn't Anglo-Saxon was uh, less than desirable. And among the non-Anglo-Saxons were, of course, the Jews. But being a Jew, naturally, he was very sensitive to any anti-Semitic overtones. Issues of race didn't, of course, only apply to the various groups of white Europeans trying to enter the States. Since the abolition of slavery, the prospects for blacks frustrated the ideal that all men were created equal. Boaz actively campaigned on behalf of black people all over America. Contrary to prevailing notions of the day, he stated that there was no evidence that they were racially inferior. The findings that he'd reported from Ellis Island challenged the concept that certain racial characteristics were fixed or stable. His were views that white America found almost totally incomprehensible, and in some quarters, they're still unaccepted today. Boaz introduced a new way of looking at race. Boaz was the first distinguished white social scientist in the United States who minimized the importance of race as a determinant of human behavior. Boaz took a deliberate and bold social stance and agitated for a more tolerant and informed approach to questions of racial difference. He even did one thing that's very, very little known, but I think is extraordinarily interesting. One of the things he asked his field workers to do, and they were a brilliant group of men that he chose, was to make life masks of the people they were working with. The, the field work spread from the northwest coast up the, the borderline to Alaska, over into Asia, and even some studies as far south as China. It's a fantastic collection. Many of these people have now become extinct. And we have the only absolute representation of these people in their full facial features. We have, I don't know, at least uh, maybe as many as 2,000. Boaz's work on the physical characteristics of humans convinced him that race itself was an awkward category. Because it was impossible to define, it was of no real scientific use. Biological differences between races are small. There is no reason to believe that one race is in nature so much more intelligent and endowed with greater willpower, nor emotionally more stable than another. Franz Boas taught at Columbia University for half a century. The list of his students who went on to set up and teach the subject along his lines at other universities reads like the who's who of American anthropology. By the time of his death, he was rightly regarded by scholars from all over the world as the founding father of American anthropology. I can still remember quite vividly what happened on that day, December 21st, 1942. Boas invited a few persons to a luncheon with Rivet at uh, the faculty club at Columbia University. It was an extremely cold day, as a matter of fact, one of the coldest day I can remember. And Boas arrived early from uh, his home, his grandhood on the other side of the Hudson. Uh, he was wearing, I remember, a very dilapidated and discolored fur cap, which probably dated back to his time with the Eskimo 50 years earlier. Boas was in, a very, in very high spirits and 
luncheon started quite uh, gaily. And then, all of a sudden, Boas uh, was struck by something like an electric uh, shock. He pushed violently and fell backward on the ground with his chair. And I was uh, seated by his side, and immediately I tried to help him, but uh, he was uh, dead. And we all left uh, struck with uh, sorrow and with the feeling that we had the sad privilege to witness the passing out of uh, one of the very last intellectual giants, such as the 19th century was able to produce, and uh, uh, whom probably uh, will not be produced anymore. His last words at that supper were that he had a new idea on race. His audience never heard what that new idea was. In his long and productive career, however, Franz Boas produced a series of new ideas that changed the way that educated Americans thought about race, language, and culture. The value of anthropology is its power to impress us with the relative value of all forms of culture. For we are only too liable to consider our civilization the ultimate goal of human evolution, thus depriving ourselves of the benefits to be gained from the teachings of others. My whole outlook upon life is determined by one question. How can we recognize the shackles that tradition has laid upon us? For when we recognize them, we are also able to break them.